All right, so I wanted to take you guys through the sedimentary environments lab because marking it, I found a number of either misconceptions or just gaps in knowledge that are important to address before the lab exam. So the goal here is not to just give you the answer. I was thinking about just putting up a key, but uh, I think this is going to be more useful, even though it's a bit more time consuming for me. So instead, I'm going to go question by question and just kind of get into the context of what I was actually after with. Uh, for a number of these things, as well as thoughts you should have when you are going through um, uh, and thinking about not just these questions, which you should be reviewing, but similar questions as well. All right, so the first, the first question involved uh, grain size. So this is the one, this referred to, um, this referred to a series of uh, glass vials that had grains of various sizes in it. And you see here is a series of grain sizes. So the important thing to remember is when we're looking at clastic rocks, let's look at clastic rocks. When we're looking at clastic rocks, remember these are rocks made of broken bits of stuff glued together, and they are going to be defined, they are going to be defined by the size of material that makes them up. So if you have very fine material, you're going to be a mudstone or a shale. If slightly bigger would be a siltstone, which is not on this list. You know, even a little bit larger is a sandstone. And really large is going to be a conglomerate or breccia, depending on if you're angular or rounded. All right. So that's pretty straightforward so far. So if you look at grain size charts like this one here, you will see that there are technical definitions for what each one of these are. I don't care that you know that a mudstone is 1 256th of a millimeter. That's how big the clay sized particles that make up a mudstone are. I just care that you know that very fine material is going to be silt or mud, right? Silt is slightly larger, mud is slightly smaller. That's what I am principally interested in. The other thing to remember is that relationship between competence, that is the largest particle that can be uh, transported by, uh, by, a, um, by um, a medium of transport. So it could be glacial ice moving, it could be water, it could be uh, wind, that transport size, competence, is going to be directly proportionate to velocity in wind and water. With ice, it doesn't really matter. Ice is functionally kind of infinitely competent. Okay, so that's going to be the second part. Remember that idea. So for this guy here, take a look at the four vials. If you weren't confident in your answers, or if I didn't give you these, go look at those vials again and think what size is the material. If you were to lithify, turn it into a rock, what would be the rock name that would result? Ask yourself that. All right, so next up was moving into the idea of transport energy and environments. I want to note that what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about it in kind of a, uh, a, a really cartoony sense. So in the reality, if you have, say, a lake, as you talked about in class, there are all sorts of complicated environments to the lake. If you have a really big lake, you can get, uh, you know, uh, even small scale kind of tidal effects associated with it. You can have, you know, ripples associated with wind driven waves, all this kind of stuff. On the other hand, a tiny little pond somewhere is going to be very different. But on average, once material makes it in to a lake, the biggest stuff is going to fall out very quickly. And the middle of the lake tends to be stratified, very fine grained stuff. So I'm interested in that kind of average story at this point, because we're doing, you know, really large scale, broad, categorical categorizations of things. If this is a sedimentology class, we could get more fine grain. But I just really want you to recognize that fundamentally, the deposits in the lake are going to look different than the deposit of, say, you know, a delta or a sand dune, right? in terms of the kinds of material that are most likely to occur there. All right, so that said, let's take a look at the categories here. So the first one we are looking at is mudstone. So here's our mudstone. So mudstone is what? That's this really fine grain material over here. So what kind of transport energy is going to move this stuff? Well, the very fine grain material requires very little energy. So let's think about a low energy environment. So what are low energy environments? A beach? Not really. I mean, that's pretty high energy. How about a tidal flat? So these are areas with, you know, very low topographic grade, which, uh, uh, where there is a strong tidal influence, large tides, and they tend to get flooded. So they're going to be pretty low energy environments. How about a river channel? Nope, that's going to be pretty high energy, generally speaking. I mean, you 
you could find tiny rivers maybe that have mud, but I mean, generally speaking, we're looking at coarser material. Lakes, absolutely. Floodplains, yeah. So remember that when a, when a river overwhelms its channel, it overflows its channel, it's going to move out, drop in velocity, drop the biggest stuff, sand and silt, right on the edge of the river, and the smallest stuff is going to get carried off to the floodplain. Deep marine. So at this point, I'm talking about, you know, the average of deep marine environments. Mostly, just like with a lake, right, the only thing they can get out into that area far away from the shore is going to be very fine grain material. Now, in Lillian's exercise, she talked to you about mass transport deposits. And remember, these things, via turbidity flows, can actually get hundreds of kilometers out into the ocean. And you can get coarser material transported that way. But with that exception, the deep marine environment is going to tend to be very fine-grained or made entirely of material uh, that is the shells of tiny microscopic organisms, so siliceous mud or calcareous mud. Where else might you find it? Well, a lagoon, remember, is a restricted marine environment. It's cut off from the ocean, you know, mostly uh, by a barrier island, something like that. A carbonate platform, if we were talking about carbonate mud, sure. But in this case, we're talking about clay-based material. So we're going to ignore that. You know, parts of deltas can have them. But again, we're thinking about the delta in its broadest sense. So it's going to tend to be silty material, sandy material, et cetera. So those are the best answers there. All right, next up, we've got conglomerates and breccias. This is coarse grain material. Where are you going to find coarse grain material? Well, think about if you go to the beach. Ideally, the beach is made of sand. But in reality, often you end up with gravel at the beach, especially at high tide. So beaches are a great spot. The channel of a river has a lot of energy, so you're going to find large stuff there. An alluvial fan, remember, is where a river emerges from a mountain, so it's high energy, it's loaded with material, and then it drops in gradient, it expands, it moves out of the mountain, it slows down and it drops stuff. Absolutely great place to put it. Now, in a deep marine setting where you have, um, in a deep marine setting where you've got a submarine channel, you could find that there, but generally speaking, you're going to deep marine is going to be finer grain stuff. But remember that you do have elements of deep marine depositional systems, the socio-submarine fans that can have very coarse grain stuff. All right, so what is our next up? Our next up we are looking at what? We're going to be looking at next up sand. So what is sand going to be like? Well, sand is going to be kind of high to medium energy, depending on the environment. So most obvious place to find sand, beaches. Sand dunes, those are both super obvious. Where else could you find them? Well, a tidal flat, you might find very fine sand or silt, sure. How about a river channel if the river is, you know, down near a water body, a long way away from the ocean, it's moving slow, things have been well evolved. Sure, absolutely you could find that there. Deep marine, yeah, sure. Within elements of submarine fans, you can find sands. But outside of that, just in a general basinal setting, not really. So I'm not going to leave that highlight, but remember, you do find large sheet sands associated with it. Maybe I'll put a little, I'll do a little underline here like this. I'll just, just to remind you, I'll put a little underline under there. Okay, so what else are you going to find? A delta, absolutely. A lot of sand gets dropped off right in the mouths of rivers. So great. All of those. Fantastic places to find them. All right, let me erase all of my annotations here. Erase you all. Erase you all. Erase this stuff over here. Okay, so moving on. Now we've got the idea of maturity. And what are we talking about when we're talking about maturity? So maturity sediment geology is going to bring us to scholarly articles. I don't want that. I want images. So here is an image showing textural maturity. So maturity, remember, has two different subcategories, textural and compositional. Compositional means the percentage of material that is resistant to erosion, or to weathering, rather. That the longer a sediment is exposed to chemical and physical attack, the less of the easy to break down material is going to be less. And so eventually, you're going to be left over with just really hard stuff, and that's going to be mostly quartz, because it's the most common hard, physically hard, and chemically resistant material on Earth. So it's going to be mostly quartz. In fact, most sediment is mostly quartz for that reason. In fact, and some sediment can be all quartz, and we'll talk about that down here below. So the other things is that if you start off, you've just broken free of a rock, you're going to tend to be pretty angular. But the longer you get thrown around on Earth for, the longer you get moved around, the rounder you are going to get. So this is a progressive movement through time, 
and through space if you're actually rolling down a river. You're going to start off really angular and eventually you're going to end up pretty round. You're going to get more sorted as well and as differences in velocity and flow characteristics are going to drop heavy stuff and move lighter stuff and shift them into different piles. The other thing is you're going to get progressively smaller over time. So let's look back here. Rounding? Yes, absolutely. Grain size? Yeah. Right? Right, mature stuff tends to be finer grain. Sorting? Absolutely. And percentage of things like quartz, resistant minerals? Heck yeah. All of those things. Okay. So that said, I want you to go back and look at the samples of these various things under the microscope. Now, for my lab section, I noticed that almost everybody had the wrong answer for sample D and sample E, but they seem to have been switched around. So I'm not sure if that's a mistake on my part or if uh, somebody switched the labels on these sections. Remember the actual letters were on the, on the lids. I think that's what happened. Uh, I think most of you actually probably got this right, but just in case, go back and take a look. So almost all of these guys are actually going to be, in fact, all of them are gonna be mostly quartz. Some of them are all quartz. With a few exceptions on Earth, when you look at sand, sand is going to be made of mostly quartz. So that is something to bear in mind. What percentage quartz, though, is going to vary. And so all of these guys here have quite a bit. And in fact, if you go take a look again, you're going to see that even the ones that don't look like they have very much probably have somewhere around, say, about 70% quartz. And these guys above and below have even more than that. So go and take a look and try to do a better estimate. Remember that quartz can look red if it is stained a little bit. So some of the quartzes don't look obviously like quartz. But if you start looking around and seeing how they're breaking, you're going to see some of the pinky stuff is breaking with obvious cleavage, your potassium feldspar, and some of it is not. And that's most likely to be quartz. Look at the grain shape again and ask yourself, Relative to over here, relative to over here, let me get a colorful guy so you can see this better, right? Do they look regularly, on average, on average are they angular or on average are they rounded, right? Take a look and ask yourself that question again. You're going to look at average amount. Obviously, they're going to vary. So within that, the next question was, what is the likely rock that they weathered from? So if they're going to be made of granite, what are they going to have lots of them in terms of minerals? Well, if they haven't weathered very much, if they're relatively immature, they should still have the composition essentially of granite. So what is granite made of? Well, let's just Google some granite. Let me get my guy over here and let's take a look at granite. And remember that when you look at granite images and they're not geological, you see a lot of stuff that actually is not granite. If you go to Home Depot, they call any igneous rock granite. But I mean, this is a pretty classic granite here. So what have you got here? You've got some potassium feldspars, this pink stuff, this gray stuff here. Right, that is likely to be quartz. This white stuff is probably some kind of plagioclase-like mineral. And then these black things here, these little black dots, these things are probably most likely biotites. You can also have things like muscovites. So most commonly, it's going to be a mixture of feldspars, often a lot of potassium feldspar, quartz, and muscovite. Most commonly is what you're going to see. So <clears throat> that is what you start off with most of the time. So take a look at this. If it's phyllite, What's phyllite like? Well, let's remind ourselves what phyllite is like. Phyllite, remember, is a igneous or a metamorphic rock. We didn't spend a lot of time on the metamorphic rocks, but it's going to be a very shiny, because it's foliated, metamorphic rock. So if you see fragments in there of actual shiny rock, you know, first, that's probably coming from this environment in the highlands with lots of phyllite, and second, that's going to be super immature. If you actually still have fragments of real rock and not individual minerals, that is a very immature rock that you're looking at. All right, next up, we've got this categorization scheme. And remember that you read this as if, and let me get my smaller marker here. You're going to read this for each thing as if the top corner or the corner is 100 and this bottom is zero. So if you had 50% quartz, you would draw a line in like this, essentially, that went across. Then you would want to read feldspar. You're going to read this top corner as if this is 100% feldspar, and the bottom relative to that is going to be zero. And so if you had 10% feldspar, you're going to be down here, and you're going to draw a line across like this. So now I've got 10%, 50%, I've got 60%, so the other 40% would have to be lithic fragments. And this would be 100% rock fragments over here. Zero for this would be this line down here. And so 40% is going to be, I probably didn't do these lines exactly, but they should all intersect. So 40% would be like right there or something like that. 
and then that would tell you that what you have is a lithic aronite. Now you can actually do the numbers. If this was a, a real uh, sedimentology or petrology class, you'd actually have to do the numbers, but I'm okay with you just eyeballing it and taking a guess. So take a look at those guys again and ask yourself, you know, are you looking at, well, first I've already said you have less than 10% matrix. If you have less than 10%, sometimes it's 15, depends on the scheme, then you are going to be a aronite. That's what that means, an aronite. Let me get my little, let me get my little marker guy here. You're going to be an aronite. There you go. And this could be not a quartz aronite, but just rather an aronite. Let me erase that so um, it's clear. You're just going to be an aronite. Uh, yellow. Where's my yellow? Nope, that's my eraser. Right, let me get my highlighter and my yellow. And my aronite. Okay. So take a look at those and ask yourself, what are you after? Remember, it was greater than 10% or greater than 15 sometimes. It is going to be a wacky. So take a look at these guys again and ask yourself, what are you looking at? If you're not 100% confident, you're going to see something like that on the exam. Frac sand. Frac sand is going to be material which is mostly quartz, very mature. So what are you thinking? It's going to be a quartz aronite, right? So take a look. But you want a really, really well sorted, really round, very mature rock is what you're after. So take a look and figure out which one of those corresponds to that. All right, what about frosting? What does frosting look like? Frosting, you have seen, uh, let's go get frosted glass. You've seen these in bathrooms. Often you get these in bathrooms so that you can get some more privacy. So you see this kind of area where you cannot see through the glass anymore, but some light can diffuse through there. And then they make these by either acid etching them or by sandblasting them. And both of those processes can also frost grains of sand. So if you look at frosted sand grain, this is something you can really get on quartz. If you look at some grains of sand, these ones here, you can see it quite well. Now you can see that the surface of this grain of sand is covered with all these little micro pits, these tiny little pits over here, like teeny little, oops, tiny little pits. Um, and that results from abrasion of sand grains slamming in and slamming in and slamming in as they're moving around in an aeolian environment usually over a long period of time and little tiny impacts keep putting tiny little pits all over it until eventually the entire thing is covered with these little tiny impacts and it ends up making a kind of opaque surface on the outside. If you see that, that is characteristic of an Aeolian environment. It's characteristic, it's not the only sign, but it's very characteristic of an Aeolian environment. So that's what I'm asking. So look at one of your samples and ask yourself that. Compare them all and convince yourself you can find the one which is Aeolian. So take a look at that again. That wasn't my, all right. So let's erase all of these guys, erase this all, don't want to erase all my little guys. All right, so next up, what have we got? Next up, we have carbonate rocks. Next up, we have carbonate rocks. So carbonate rocks, remember, are, in fact, in general, chemical sedimentary rocks are rocks which have precipitated out of water as opposed to rocks which are made of stuff which has been glued back together. So you have my chemical sedimentary rocks. Chemical sedimentary rocks can be made of all sorts of minerals. Gypsum is a common one. Halite is a common one. You don't see that in the surface very much because it dissolves away, but we've talked about how it's very important uh, in the subsurface in terms of creating environments for uh, petroleum to accumulate. The most common rock, though, is up in the chemical category are carbonate rocks. And the reason for that is that most of the chemical material you see did not form via evaporation. Most of the chemical material you see is the result of um, is the result of organisms pulling material out of solution to build their shells out of. And the most common material that organisms build their shell out of is not the only one. They build things out of like appetite. They build things out of silica. But the most common thing they build their shells out of is going to be some kind of calcium carbonate mineral. The two most common being aragonite and calcite. And so that is the material that is the building block of most chemical sedimentary rocks, are those bits of shells. Remember, it can also precipitate out, even carbonate can precipitate out around hot springs, things like that. So as a general rule, the place where you find carbonate material being precipitated is a marine environment. And that's because that's where most of the organisms that do the precipitation live in abundance. It's also where the most material is in solution, right? The most ions are in solution to to build things out of. So this is not a guarantee, but if you come across, if you come across a 
limestone, you can make a pretty good assumption that what you are looking at is you are looking at a marine environment. We'll, we'll come around to that in a moment. Anyways, take a look at this sample and I want to ask yourself, yes, it is a kind of sand in the sense that it is made of sand-sized particles, but for our purposes, we've been referring to sand as just silicious material. So take a look at it and ask yourself, are you looking at shells or are you looking at fragments of broken rock? And you're going to have a hard time telling unless you put it under a microscope. That's a general rule. Try to get magnification anytime you're trying to determine something else. All right, so the material you have, if you're looking at carbonate environments, can be anything from a coral reef. That's a reminder of what a coral reef is. It can be anything from a coral reef, you know, where you actually have essentially rock to start off with. You know, all of this material you see here that was precipitated by an organism, and it's already solid rock. This is already a kind of limestone, right? It exists here, and it exists on a massive scale sometimes. This material can get broken down, though, into smaller fragments. It can get eaten by fish who will then kind of poo it out and you'll end up with very small mud sized material. But you also have material from everything from mud up to sand, you know, or bigger, you know, gravel sized material, which is being made as shells directly. But chalk is made by little things called coccolithophores. Coccolithophores. So coccolithophores are tiny microscopic organisms, but they can bloom and we use the term bloom like a flower bloom. We just mean it a, like a, uh, a dramatic expansion of their abundance if conditions are just right. On scales you can literally see from space. I think this might be Portugal. I don't know where this is. But you see all this white stuff. This is literally a satellite image. Those are trillions of microorganisms. When they die, they are going to leave by a thick deposit. And that thick deposit is going to form chalk. So here is an example of really thick deposits. You see all this, there's a mass wasting event right there. All of this here is made of trillions and trillions of tiny microscopic shells. And you can see this is a broad area. This stuff is actually pretty, uh, pretty common during the Cretaceous period in particular. In fact, the Cretaceous period literally means the chalk period, the creta part of it there. So when it starts off, it actually has very high porosity, but it can become more cemented over time to the point where it can lose most of its porosity. This stuff can be a fairly important reservoir rock. Um, in the North Sea, for example, large areas off of Norway, they have, uh, they have chalk as a reservoir. Most of the porosity is secondary, some of it's still primary there. So if you were to go and look at this rock right here, I can tell you this rock is very porous. If you go on the other side to Ireland, which is where I collected uh, this sample down here, this sample 101, you are going to see that this behaves a little bit differently. So how do you tell if it's porous? The easiest way of telling if it's porous, I mean, there's complicated ways you could do it, is literally just put a drop of water on it. Does it get sucked in? If it gets sucked in, it's porous. So if you have not done that experiment, go and try it. Over here, we have a sample that I asked you about, sample 100, which is chalk. And I want you to think about where you're gonna get chalk accumulating. So could you build this up over here? Right, this over here. Could you build that environment if turbidic flows kept bringing sediment in all the time? If every once in a while sediment kept coming in like this, would you get this perfectly pure white? Because remember, the white is being made by little things living up in the water that are falling out and dying and getting slowly deposited down below, layer by layer. If you're also bringing in mud and sand, is it going to look like that? So that being the case, do you think you are likely to find chalks really close to the shore where you've got lots of sand and that being brought in or relatively deep. I don't mean, you know, 5,000 meters deep. I mean, 100 meters deep. Offshore, far enough that you are, uh, offshore, far enough that you're away from most of the sedimentation coming from the shore. So going back to our example here, do you think you are likely to find a buildup of chalky material? Are you going to find a buildup of chalky material right along the shore here? where all the sediment from the shore is coming in? Or are you more likely to find it relatively deep over here where you are separated from that sediment? So think about that. All right, what do we have next up? Next up we had evaporites. So evaporites, remember, are a category of sedimentary rock which is formed when you remove sufficient water via evaporation that the material in solution builds up in abundance that it actually starts to precipitate out on its own. And the most common evaporites are gonna be gypsum and salt. And those are important for us in petroleum for a couple of reasons. One, 
You remember when gypsum and salt are under pressure, they start to deform, and because they are light and buoyant, they start to form domes, salt domes, or diapirs, more correct word, moving up and pushing their way through the sediment, through the rocks, deforming it and causing traps, potentially. They're also a relatively impermeable rock, and so they can act as a cap rock as well. So what kind of environment do you think you are likely to build up sufficient material in solution so that you can precipitate it out? Well, let's think about that. If you are in an environment, if you're in an environment where, you know, if this is my pool of water here, here's my pool of water, right? I have some material, which is I have some little ions in solution here, and I want to build up more of them. So how am I likely to do that? Well, the simplest way is just to get rid of the water via evaporation. So if I keep getting rid of this water, if I eventually get rid of the water and now I drop it down, so now it's, you know, now the water is down here, I have the same number of ions, but they are concentrated in a smaller area. So it's becoming more concentrated, my solution. Now, what happens if I've got a rain cloud up here? This is a rain cloud. Here's my rain cloud. And for every bit of water that comes out, rain is coming back in. What is going to happen to the volume of water in this area? It's not going to change at all, okay? Think as well about the rate of evaporation in hot and cold climates. And that should give you an idea of the most likely environments that you are going to find these things. Oh, this is going to be a pain to get my little dots. I shouldn't have made those tiny dots. Let's get you all. There, I've got all the dots. I'll get these things over here too. All right, so that's what you're going off here. Next up, you're looking at a series of specimens. And I want you to think again about fundamental aspects of depositional environments. First and simplest ones, are you looking at a terrestrial or are you looking at a marine environment? So you're looking at something, you know, either that would have been right on the shore, so a marginal marine or a deep marine environment actually under the ocean. So there are lots of indicators you can have, but sometimes it's pretty subtle. In fact, sometimes it's impossible to tell without more context. I, if you give you a sandstone, that sandstone could have occurred in a couple of environments. There are a couple of really simple ways of at least getting a pretty good understanding, a pretty good idea of what you might be looking at, forming a pretty reasonable hypothesis. The first is that most carbonate material, as I already mentioned, forms in marine environments. So if you are looking at a limestone, you are most likely looking at a marine rock. Okay? That is not always going to be the case, but it is the case enough of the time that you can say with pretty high confidence, if you had to make a guess, that if you're looking at a limestone, you are probably looking at a marine rock. Another good indicator is if you have shelly material in there. If you have things like clams and uh, snails, or if you're looking at an older rock, things like crinoids and trilobites, those things are either entirely marine organisms or they're things that mostly lived in the, in the water. On the other hand, if you're looking at, if you are looking at, say, plant material, you are probably looking at non-marine. Now, why is that? Well, think about where do trees live? Trees do not grow in the ocean. Now, sure, a tree could die and it could fall in a river and it could get carried out. If you go to the ocean here, in fact, and you go to the beach, you find driftwood. What you don't find, generally speaking, except maybe after a big storm or something, you don't tend to find a lot of just perfectly preserved branches floating around. On the other hand, if you go to a river anywhere or a lake, you're going to find perfectly preserved branches because they're growing directly next to or even in sometimes, right on the edge of those water bodies. So those are good places to start. Ask yourself, are you, looking at, are you looking at a limestone? Are you looking at a sandstone or a shale, but the sandstone of the shale has shelly organisms? So clams, snails, or their extinct equivalents. Or is there some evidence that you're actually directly dealing with a terrestrial environment in the form of terrestrial organisms? Do you see that there? Is there evidence that whatever you're looking at has been exposed to the air periodically? Or things like raindrop impressions or mud cracks. That at best means you're in a marginal marine environment. If you see those things there, you could be in an area like a tidal flat that gets periodically exposed to the uh, air, but you're definitely not in a deep marine environment. If you see something that occurs through surface exposure, like a mud crack or a raindrop impression. The next thing we had was this idea here of energy. And remember that energy is going to be proportioned to grain size. Sure. And most of you guys said that. Most of you guys said things like uh, it's got small grain size, therefore it is low energy. That's fine. Those were fine. But there was more to see in these samples than just that. So think about what is going to happen to the material within it. 
if it is, and any structure as well within it, if you're in a high energy environment. So if you've got waves smashing back and forth, back and forth, you know, your waves are smashing around back and forth, what is going to happen to anything that's being moved around with the waves? They're going to smash into each other and get broken up. So you'd expect to find in a high energy environment shells to be pretty broken up. You'd also obviously expect to find relatively coarser grain material, maybe sand instead of mud. The other thing is if you look within the rock itself, you can often see very fine scale features. So maybe you see, you know, maybe you see little cross beds in there. Or maybe you see very small things we call laminations, really fine layering. If this again was getting smashed up and moved back and forth all the time, these layers would get all convoluted and broken up and you wouldn't find them. You would also not find things sitting in life position. So if you have a clam and that clam is just sitting in its position that it was originally, that's supposed to be a clam, was originally in, if this was an environment that's moving back and forth, that clam is gonna get flipped over, smashed apart, if it's sitting in position, then that had to be a low energy environment. What if you find something like a footprint or something perfectly preserved, or the trail, that's supposed to be a footprint of a bird or something, or the trail of a little, this might be a snail's trail moving across. Again, if this is in a high energy environment, these things are going to get wiped out. So all of those can be indicators beyond just grain size. So don't just use grain size. So go back and take a look at those things if you haven't already, and think about what the story overall they are telling you is. Right. Is it high? Is it low? Is it high energy? Is it low energy? For each one of these, ask yourself that question. The next one was sample H, and this is a very characteristic rock. Most of you identified it correctly. This portion here, though, people didn't do great on. And this is the portion asking about environments. So these ones were ones that was gravel, absolutely, and it was rounded. So think about how do you become rounded? Well, everyone said high energy environment, etc. That's, that's an explanation for why you have big stuff there. But how do you become rounded? To become rounded, you've got to roll around a lot. What kind of environment are you rolling around a lot? And how long do you have to roll for until you become rounded? So in comparison, when you're looking at H and H1, ask which one was rolling the most. I remember that not all, all rivers are equal. If you're in a braided river, you tend to be up close to the environment that the material actually came out of. So up in the mountains where you're getting overwhelmed by sediment and you're very close to the source of the grains. So they're gonna look like they just came out of a rock. They're gonna be pristine, they're gonna be angular. If you've been rolling around for a long time in the river, you're gonna get progressively more round. So look at these and think about that. And especially when you're answering this question, think about that. All right, so what was next? Let's erase all my things here. Erasing all my things and we will look at the next question. The next question was about sedimentary structures. So by sedimentary structures, I mean some feature that forms within the rock during deposition that tell you something about the conditions of deposition. So if, for example, I have a rock which is being exposed to the surface, it might dry out and contract and form a mud crack. So that's a secondary feature beyond the mud. It's something in addition to the mud that tells me something about the environment. It's an environmental signature. And this is gonna have a subsection of, of things we've looked at here. Not included in that is cross beds, which are kind of a cross section of ripples. And these are all gonna tell you something interesting with the environment of deposition. So a trace fossil, to remind you, a trace fossil is the term we use for a fossil of, a, of an organism's behavior. So there are a bunch of different categories that could be trace fossils. You know, a trace fossil could be the footprint of something. You've got a little, this is a bird's footprint again. There's a bird's footprint. It could be the trail. It could be if you've got a bone, you know, this is a bone. It's supposed to be a bone. And something's been eating the bone you might see teeth marks in the bone, right? Those teeth marks are a trace fossil, whereas the bone itself is just a regular fossil. So a trace fo a fossil is the organism's activity. If you have the body of an organism, we just call that a fossil. Sometimes we call them body fossils, I don't really care. So take a look at each one of these categories. Try to identify what you're looking at within this list here and ask yourself as well, what does that mean? If you see mud cracks, what kind of environment do you have to be in? Are you underwater? Right. Well, you had to be wet at some point, obviously, because you, be, you had to have wet mud to dehydrate. Are you gonna be in a cold environment or hot environment? 
air environment or a wet environment on average if you have that. So think about that. Think about climate and environment. We're using these as proxies to get additional information about the environment and the setting right, of each one of these things. So something beyond just grain size. You know? So to differentiate different kinds of mud to tell us information about the environment itself. So go through each one of these categories and ask yourself that stuff. All right, specimen M, I put it away. It's on the back shelf now. It's sitting up on a display unit there. It's big. Don't take it off. It'll fall on you. Specimen A shows ripples. And ripples are going to look something like this. So here are my ripples, geology. Here are some ripples. So here are some ripples. In fact, this is pretty much identical to the specimen you're going to see. Over here are some ripples in the real world. That is a beach deposit. And here's a beach deposit. Here is, these are ripples in rock, but they're next to a beach, just by coincidence. If you were to look within a ripple, what you would see is the ripple is actually made up of layers of sediment that slowly built up upon themselves as sediment was transported along, hit an area where it was relatively protected from the flow of the wind or the flow of the water. So it was an area of low energy and it settled there. And over time, they're going to move forwards, creating these patterns internally, if you were able to see a cross-section, any of these, if you were able to see a cross-section, you would see internal patterns within them we call cross-bedding. All right, so when you are looking at ripples, you can have two principal forms of ripple, depending on what the direction of the flow was. So if flow is going, you know, this direction like this, what is the pattern going to look like? Well, you are going to form, you are going to form a thing that has this general shape relatively low angle and then a relatively steep side like that. So this is an asymmetrical ripple. So what happens is a little grain goes bouncing along, it bounces along here, it's bouncing along, carried along. And then when it gets over to this side here, it's protected by this little ridge from the wind or the water. And so it tends to settle in here. So they tend to settle and they build up here until they hit beyond the angle of repose and they collapse. And so over time, this stuff is going to migrate forwards. These lines are just showing where you migrated from. This whole thing is going to migrate like this. So they're going to build up layers. They're going to build up layers. And you can see those internal layers with cross bedding. You see them here. They are right here. There's the layers. There's the layers. There's the layers. All right. If, on the other hand, the current is flipping back and forth 180 degrees, you're going to build it like this for a while. And then you're going to turn it around and build it the other way. And so what you're going to end up with is a ripple which looks more or less symmetrical. That is an evidence you've been exposed. These are examples probably of symmetrical ripples right there, that you've been exposed to flipping directionality. So what environment do you get 180 degree flipping in current every year, day? Well, think about that. It's pretty obvious. Tide comes in, tide goes out. Now, looking at the specimens there, there's actually a disagreement between Lillian and I. Lillian, uh, I think, told most of you these are asymmetrical ripples. She might be right. When I look at them, I am pretty convinced that on average they are symmetrical. And so we have a different interpretation. I wasn't super concerned um, about what you put down for interpretation, so long as you had a plausible explanation. If you think you were looking at symmetrical ripples, you need to know you were looking at oscillating current direction, and you need to know the kind of environment that would occur in. If you think you were looking at symmetrical ripples, you have to know that you are looking at continuous directional flow and think about the kind of environment that is going to occur in. All right. Next up, we get specimen N. This was a large thing, and already you should get an idea of what this might be in terms of mode of transport. What is capable of moving large boulder-sized material? Is it going to be wind? Is it going to be water, liquid water, or is it going to be solid water in the form of glacial ice? So think about that. So think about that. You should already have the answer. And then if you don't know this, Google what you're going to call scratches that are formed from that kind of transport. All right, so this gets into trace fossils or ichnofossils. That's the fancy word for trace fossils. If you are someone who studies trace fossils, you are an ichnologist. The study of trace fossils is called ichnology. I am not an ichnologist. There is an entire field of study on this. But you can understand enough to make broad interpretations with just a couple of basic principles. That said, ichnologists can do super cool things. And based on particular uh, collections of trace fossils, that you can get very specific environmental information uh, from ichnology. It's a really powerful discipline in terms of 
environmental analysis, particularly for things like water depth. But the basic rule of ecology is that if you are in an environment where you have a lot of sediment being deposited, like a lot of it's being rapidly deposited like this, and you are something like a little clam who lives in here, you need to burrow upwards to stay above that sediment. Otherwise, you're going to get buried in it. And this could be a lot of sediment coming in, or it can just be the sediment that's getting moved around all the time, like right at the high tide zone where the waves are crashing in. If the sediment's being moved around all the time, you're also going to have to keep burrowing up and down. It's the only way of dealing with that. Also, if you made a really fine thing on the surface here, it's going to get obliterated. It's either going to get buried or it's going to get obliterated by that movement. So as a general rule, in relatively shallow water environments where you've got a lot more energy associated, a lot more sediment coming in, you tend to see vertical barrows. On the other hand, when you go into deeper water, you tend to see, let's just look up some trace fossils. You tend to see more complicated, more complicated things like this. Right? So these are examples of things moving around the surface. There's a very complicated, some kind of feeding structure there. Things like this you tend to see in deeper water. Now you could get this absolutely in an environment that's being periodically exposed, like a tidal flat, right? where it's exposed for a while, kind of dries out, and then a new layer gently comes on top of it. You're not going to find something like that preserved right on a beach where the waves are crashing in. Not at all. So you can get some basic depth information just by asking yourself, on average, am I looking at fairly complicated horizontal burrowing, right? Or am I looking at vertical burrowing? So take a look at this and ask yourself that question. The next question was about a different kind of bedding, and I'll give this one away. This was about cross bedding. So let's look at my cross beds. So cross bedding, here's my cross beds. So where you have cross bedding, you have these internal lines that are showing you the angle where the material has been building up and where it's been migrating along. So in this case, migrating this direction like this. If you look at these guys here, in this case, migrating that direction like that. So there are a few things you can get from here that can help you figure out if you're looking at ripples that might have been formed by something like a river or the tides, or if you're looking at something formed by the wind. The first thing is that really large scale ripples are just sand dunes. So if you look at a sand dune, what does a sand dune look like? A sand dune, these things are really large. They can be, I mean, here's there's people walking along over here. These are really large structures. And in fact, wind is the only way you're capable of making ripples this size. So if you see really large ripples, you're probably looking at an aeolian deposit. The second thing is you look at the sediment itself. This sediment seems to be, seems, is usually mostly sand and it's usually really mature. A third thing is you could look at directionality. So in dune systems, they often tend to be more movement of the directionality of wind. Right? It can come in different directions. That's not always the case, but it can. So you may see oscillating directionality in terms of when you're building it up. So if you look at these cross beds, for example, you can see they are changing direction. This one's not really changing direction, but some of them are changing direction. You can see the scale of these things. This one's changing direction. You can see the scale of these are huge. These are trees. That is an example for sure of an aeolian deposit. So take a look at this guy here and ask your question. Do you think you're looking at river deposit or wind deposit? And again, I actually don't care that you get this particularly right. What I am interested in is that there is geological reasoning, that you put evidence down here. And this happened too much in your responses. There was a lot of things where people would just put one answer in there. That's not what I'm after. What I am more concerned about is that you have put thought into it. You have looked at the rock. You have taken information from the rock and you've interpreted that information to support a hypothesis. All right, what do we got next? Next, we have an example of something, uh, of another kind of structure. And this is what we call it grading. So graded, let's go graded bedding. So when geologists are talking about graded bedding, what we are talking about is a shift in grain size moving upwards. Now, a lot of you talked about things like the change in, um, in water level or energy over time. So that is true for something like if you go from sandstone to mudstone on a broader scale. These things, generally speaking, what you're looking at is a, often is a single event, right? A very rapid shift in the amount of energy associated with something. So with your jar, when you shake it up and let it go, the biggest stuff comes through and then it falls out the finer stuff. If you see this kind of stuff, you are often looking at a single depositional event, not always, 
Right? You can be looking at a change over time as things migrate out as well. That's common in things like alluvial fans. But you may be looking at a single event. Ordinarily, it goes from coarse to fine. There are certain deposits that are inverted like this. These are rare, and we don't really need to talk about these, how these things form. Um, you may find these, for example, in alluvial fans that are moving forwards, that are building up over time. So take a look at this one sample and ask yourself, are you looking at you know, a bed that accumulated over time, or is this a rapid deposit? And one evidence you might be looking at a rapid deposit is what we call soft sediment deformation. Soft sediment deformation. You get this when you have sedimentary rocks that you have put a lot of weight on top of, or you have put shear stress on top of before the sedimentary rock became a sedimentary rock. So when it was still sediment. And so the sediment is capable of forming because it's just mud and water at that point. So take a look at the sample, at sample number O, and ask yourself, do you see grading, sample Q, sorry, do you see grading, and do you see any evidence of soft sediment deformation? If that's the case, then you probably drop, dropped a bunch of material on it simultaneously. And if that's the case, think about what kind of depositional environment dumps a bunch of material simultaneously onto something. Okay, next up we've got soul markings. Soul markings, I don't mean like ghosts, your soul, S-O-U-L. I mean like the soul of a shoe. So the soul of a shoe is what? It is the bottom of the shoe. So here's a, here are some soles, some soles of the shoe. So if I look at soul markings in geology, why they are called soul markings, here are some soul markings, is because they always occur on the bottom of a bed. So let me explain that. So here is my, these are examples, these are flute marks, this is one particular kind. So how these things form, I think some of you were not totally clear, so I'm going to run through this. So imagine this yellow part does not exist, there is no yellow part there, and instead what we have is just this pink layer like this. This is the ground right now. Now there's a mass transport event, so there's been a submarine landslide, and it sent a bunch of sediment going through, it's mixing to the water, it's forming a turbidity current, it's now rushing down. The bottom of it is coarse, very viscous material. It's sand. It's capable of scouring and eroding. And so that bottom material actually erodes down. It removes some of this pink material and it erodes down and it makes a series of scours like this. It makes a series of scours like this. So now instead of the surface looking like it did originally, now the surface looks like this with a bunch of holes. So that's what it looks like now. Then, later on, or even actually in the same event, that turbidity flow, once it's done its scouring, it can then deposit as well, so it can even be in the same event. Now what's it going to do? Well, it's going to fill in this material. So this is all going to get filled in. We'll fill in this material here. There we go. We're filling it in. So now let me ask you this. Remember, so now what happens if I get this stuff here, and I... I get this stuff here, and I remove this blue layer and flip it over. Now I'm going to have a blue layer that has these round, round structures on the bottom of it. Notice it's on the bottom or the sole of the overlying layer. That's what a sole mark is. A sole mark is a structure which is actually a cast of a structure that used to be negative, used to have negative relief. And so it's not the original structure, it's a cast of it that occurs on the bottom of the rock that used to lie over top. So we actually use these in geology to figure out which layer is up. If you come across, like in this example here, in this example here we had, um, here is some sole marks right there. You know that you were looking at the bottom of a layer, right? that the top of the layer is on the other side of this right here. That's the first thing. The other thing you can actually get is directionality from this. So there's one particular kind that's very, most of these are actually closely associated, not to all these, but they're often very associated with turbidity flows. So one of them is called a flute mark. And this is, you didn't see an example of this in class, but these are really characteristic. So when the, when the current's coming along, it will actually gouge out a steep chunk will scour out, and then it makes it less like that, this direction. So this is the current going this direction. In this case, the steep part of the gouge is going to be up current. When this fills in, then, you're going to get a blobby end like this and a more kind of dispersed end like this. 
that's telling you the current was going that direction. So if we go back to our example over here, where's our example, there's our soul marks, and we look at these guys here, look at any of these guys here, you can figure out current from them. So where's the current? That's going this direction, because there's the blobby end. Right? Uh, that's a more complicated kind of thing here. So there's the blobby end, the current was going this direction here. So you can get directionality from this as well. So take a look at these soul markings and figure out directionality. Now it's not just, these are flute marks. These are flute marks, the current was going this direction. The current was going that direction. These are really characteristic of turbidity flows. But you can also get things like, if you had a little rock and that rock was, you had a little rock and the rock was, you know, bouncing along, going bounce, bounce, bounce. Everywhere it hits the ground, it might leave a little hole and that can fill in. If you had a you know, stick that was getting pulled along, it can leave a linear line like that. It will leave a drag mark and that can get filled in as well. So all of those things are going to show up in a cast form on the base of a layer of rock. And that's why they are called soul marks. Okay. So those are some soul marks. Draw the picture, figure out current from that. That should be no problem at all. Next up is lamination. So lamination is a term we use for, if you look at bedding in geology, by bedding we are talking about when you have different kinds of rocks, sedimentary rocks, which are layered on top of each other. So ordinarily they are horizontal. Remember these were originally horizontal and they alternate between different kinds of rocks. And these are often because of sea level changes or changes in you know, local conditions. These are cross beds you can see here. We talked about cross beds form. <clears throat> so these are all examples of beds. There's a human being down here for scale in this one here. There's a human being for scale. And so these are probably layers of shale and these are probably layers of either sandstone or mudstone right here. If you were to look within any one of these, any one of these layers of, if you look at any one of these layers within it, so this is a bed, 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 any one of these, this is a bed, 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 bed. But if you were to look within one of these layers, you would probably see very fine scale uh, bedding on a kind of millimeter to like a sub centimeter scale. And when you see that, we call that lamination. So lamination is just really fine scale bedding. And you tend to get this in mudstones. Not always, you can get it in sandstones and things too. It tends to show up in mudstones. So how does that form? Well, it forms obviously in very low energy environments. Well, why do I say that? Because if you were to make these very fine layers like this, very fine layers, and anything came along, any current came along afterwards, it's gonna break these layers up. It's gonna obliterate them. So to preserve those very fine layers, you had to have very fine materials slowly settling out, making a flat layer, and then it had to not be broken up afterwards. So if you see lamination, you are probably looking at a very low energy environment. Think deep marine, think, uh, you know, think uh, in the middle of a lake, etc. Now this word over here, barbs, I just want you to Google that word. That's a very specific geological word and that specimen should become really cool to you once you realize what a barb is. I collected that in Ontario. All right, next up we've got stigmaria. What's stigmaria? You guys saw stigmaria if you came on the field trip with me. We found some stigmaria, lots of them, some beautiful ones actually. All right, so let's erase all this stuff. So stigmaria is a fossil and it is specifically the fossil of the root of a tree. Here's one in context. There's one in context. There is the tree trunk. This tree trunk is in its still its original position. You can see the layers horizontally were deposited on either side of it. There is a root coming off of it, penetrating down here. So that is a root of stigmaria. You can see another bit of a root right here. That's part of the stigmaria there as well. So these things were kind of neat in that they were one main root, but then coming off of the main root were a series of little micro roots. You often don't see these micro roots. Where you do, you know that that root is still in its original position exactly where it was growing. So for this question here, what I was after is I wanted you to take a look and make an interpretation based just on the sediment itself. So what have you got? Well, take a look at it. It's a very fine grained sandstone. Where do you mostly find sandstones? So make an interpretation based just on the sandstone and then ask yourself, wherever that environment is, if a tree was growing there, does that constrain or change your interpretation? So when we're doing interpretations, we gotta use all of the information we have. So when we're constructing a facies, when we're trying to come up doing facies analysis, we're trying to figure out the totality of all of the characteristics. And those are gonna be 
Lithological, so sedimentary size, particle size, you know, material type. They're also going to be structural, where you've got, by, which I mean sedimentary structures, cross beds, mud cracks, all those things, as well as biological. Do you have information in there of organisms? So I was looking up, for example, about uh, freshwater limestones. I don't think I've ever seen a freshwater limestone. They exist. So how would you even tell one? How would you tell if you're looking at a freshwater limestone? I mean, if you just had to make a guess, isn't it most responsible to say it's marine, given that most are marine? Well, yeah, it is. But what could you have that could be diagnostic? And one of the things you can have, apparently, one of the things people use to work on this stuff, is the presence of freshwater snails or terrestrial snails or a very specific kind of snail. And if you have one of those in there, the odds are it was probably living next to a freshwater environment. Right? You might have, there's also microorganisms that live there. If you had lots of if you had lots of tree material, plant material, it'd be a good explanation, a good, a good indication. So any one of these things can be indications. So think about this whenever you're looking at this about the totality of the information. Don't just get distracted by one thing, but come up with the most plausible scenario that can explain all of the information that is contained within that rock. Turn it over, look it up and down. Sometimes the information will be in conflict. And then come up with an explanation that is most plausible, you think, based on the totality of that. All right, what else we have next? This next part, most of you guys did wrong. And so I want, if you got this wrong, I want you to go back and revisit this whole section here. So this next part here, you were supposed to look and you were supposed to pick a specific, you're supposed to pick a specific specimen and come up with a plausible explanation for that. Most of you guys just either picked one specimen and didn't really see anything down here, or you didn't pick a specimen and you just wrote out what that environment was. I don't care what a tidal flat is. I want to know what the evidence that a tidal flat would give you that in fact it is a tidal flat. So what do the sediments and the structures and the organisms that live there, their trace fossils, what is that, what, what is the, what are the signatures that a tidal flat are going to, is, is going to provide that would allow you to recognize one in the rock record? So I wanted you to find one of the specimens we looked at, an actual sample that we've already looked at, and for each one of these categories, find a sample that corresponds and tell me why, right? Tell me why you think that that is a correct spot for it to go. I am less concerned that you actually have it right than that you have made a convincing argument of why, that there is geological reasoning going on. So for each one of these things. So that's gonna involve obviously you knowing what the environments are like, which is the first part. That's just where you stop them. Unless you just wrote what the environments are like. Next, I want you to find a specimen and find the evidence in there. So if you have a braided river, what is a braided river? It forms up in the headlands of a river where a river is getting overwhelmed by sediment, tends to form these temporary bars that migrate around. So what's the sediment going to be like? Gravel dominated, immature. There might be evidence of uh, particular kinds of internal uh, cross bedding as these, as these uh, bars migrate down the channel, etc. What's a tidal flat going to look like? Well, let's take a look at a tidal flat. Let's look at some tidal flats. Here are some tidal flats. A tidal flat, remember, is an area where you have relatively low changes in elevation and relatively high tide, so that large areas are get inundated during each tidal cycle. So the tide is going to slowly invade this and slowly go back out. So this is going to be tend to be you know pretty fine grain, muddy, silty kind of stuff. When it's exposed, here are some people walking around. Look at this one. You see all these little footprints. There are people walking around. I mean, these are trace fossils being left by human beings right now in the mud. So muddy material, right? Potentially trace fossils when it's exposed, these might get preserved, they might not. On the other hand, if you have a little bit of current, infra current coming in and out, you can get ripples as well. Those are quite common in tidal flats. So any of these things, grain size, presence of ripples, symmetrical ripples usually, right? the, uh, the presence of fine scale channels, you can see very fine scale channels here presence of trace fossils or evidence of drying out, particular organisms that live in this kind of environment, right? Marine organisms are going to live here. Any one of those are going to be evidence of a tidal flat. So take a look, right? Lagoons, turbidity flows. What are these environments like? What are the sedimentary signatures of each one of these environments? All right, so go and revisit that if you didn't get well on that, because that's going to be a big part of the lab exam. This final section, again, there are some problems with. And uh, next year, I'm going to have to make the directions a little bit clearer. So this guy right here, this guy right here is a, this is a stratigraphic section. This is a way that, 
a stratigraphic column, sorry. This is a way that geologists represent what the layers of rock are like in an area. We use symbols, and the symbols are kind of, they're, they're fairly unified. People use the same ones. These little things that look like bricks, those always equal limestones. Usually ones that look like, they usually have little dots like this if it's sandstone. Uh, mudstone often has little lines in it like this. So there's a couple things. First, you can you see that the limestone or the mudstone layers are sticking in like this, whereas the limestone and the sandstone are sticking out more? Well, there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that's actually how these things look in the real world if you come across a section. And so it's a shorthand visual way of telling you about the rocks themselves and their weathering characteristics. So if I go into Google Photos and I look at my own photos, go to Google Photos. I want to show you something cool. I think I showed you this in class, but I want to show you a few anyways. You can snoop in my life right now, see all my photographs. All right, go into here, by the way, is an awesome fluvial environment. Notice the change in velocity as it, as it changes in gradient, also as it constrains the channel dimensions change, the dramatic change in velocity, a dramatic change in erosional potential, etc. All right, so what I wanted to show you are these shots right here. <clears throat> so these are some shots I took when I was in Arizona. So you can see this is mud. What kind of environment are you in? Well, obviously it's a relatively arid one. These are drying out. So those are some mud cracks right there. Now this was super cool because these are modern mud cracks. They're forming right now. This is not rock, this is sediment. In the background here, these rocks are over 200 million years old. And by coincidence, they happen to be next to each other. They're, this environment has not been constant for 200 million years. It's just a coincidence that the ones in the background happen to have been formed in a very similar environment to the environment that exists today. So it's pretty cool to be able to see these two things juxtaposed against each other. The actual sediment today in the environment that exists relative to rocks that show the signature of a very similar environment from the past. Okay, so you can see that some of the layers are sticking out more. I'm going to show you a picture that shows that really well. Where's that picture that shows that really well? Oh, we have to go back. Here's the picture that shows that really well. Okay, right here. These were these are shots taken directly behind the hotel I was staying at. And I want you to see that some of the layers are sticking way in like this, and some of them are not. These layers here are not. And they're actually here, these black things, those are not black layers, those are recesses. So it's snuck back a lot here, so you can't even see the layer. You can see by looking at this how this is falling apart. This is all mudstone. So what do you think this area here that's not falling apart might be? That is sandstone. And so this here ends up sticking out more because it's more resistant to chemical and physical attack than this very fine grain stuff. This stuff just disintegrates when it gets wet. So in these columns, we make our mudstone stick in when we draw them, just like the mudstone actually sticks in in reality. Okay, so that's how you're going to draw them. For this part of the exercise, I wanted you guys to go through and find a specific sample in your kit somewhere, or in your kit, the sample that we looked at, that could plausibly correspond or would correspond to the general description. Now the caveat is, uh, the kind of limestone you might find just before a mudstone or this thing here, I don't really care that the limestone you use that you find is actually a mudstone that could occur there. So for example, here are, I want you to find one that had bioturbation. The only bioturbation sample we have is actually probably a pretty deep water one, but just put it in here. I just want you to see that you can see these structures. And I unfortunately don't have infinite rocks. It looks like I do, but I don't have the perfect rocks to put in this section. So find something that corresponds with the, with the description of what these rocks are like, and then put the corresponding letter in here, B, A, C, whatever. Then I want you to think about overall, what is the story the rocks are telling you? Is the sea level in this area changing? And if it is changing, how is it changing? Is it changing by rising of going from a more terrestrial to a marine or a shallow marine to a deeper marine? Or is it falling? Is it going from you know, a deeper marine to a shallow marine or a shallow marine to a terrestrial? So that's a question. Now think about the kinds of rocks and the environments they're deposited in. The next section, so that's down here. I need, importantly, an explanation. Many of you did not give me an explanation. All right. So what is next? Next up, I want you to just draw me a column like this. And this is pretty straightforward. Here's the description. Many of you just did not use the scale here. So if this is 3.25 meters, make sure you put 3.25 meters in. Bear in mind, this is a core. So this is going to be the top, bottom. So make sure the bottom goes on the bottom. Put these things in. I don't care that they're colored the right color. 
just make them have the right symbols that you have up here. And then again, look at this, look how it's changing, look which one's on the top, which one's on the bottom. Here's a sandstone, there is a limestone, and ask what environments do they most plausibly represent? If you see them in a sequence where you assume Walter's Law, remember they were originally adjacent environments, how are the environments moving? Is the shoreline moving out, the shoreline moving in? So is this a regressive, that is the shoreline is moving out, the sea level is dropping, or a transgressive, the shoreline is moving in, sea level is rising. So that's the big thing there. So the real big take home from all of this stuff, the real big take home from all of this is your capacity to be able to think like a geologist. When you are looking at rocks like this, asking yourself, what story plausibly could explain, you know, the oscillation environments you're seeing here or, or types of rock? You know, what are the total things? This is red, you've got mudstones, there might be cracks in this. What kind of environment best explains what you're seeing there? And you might not be right, but so long as it's a plausible interpretation, you've done what you can do. So that is the big takeaway from any of this. So go through, I really suggest you guys go through all this stuff, look at any areas you don't understand. You can just jump through this video as you need to. If you have any additional questions, please do come and ask me the questions. If this helps, let me know because I can make these things. They take a while to make. This is, I think, my third time trying to make this video. I've spent a lot of hours making this thing. But once they're done, they're done. They can just live on YouTube. So if this is a useful thing, I'll make more of these for future classes and they can act potentially as help. So let me know. Let me know if you liked it. Let me know if there were things you hated about it as well in terms of just the general format. Uh, and I'll try to change it next time. All right. Good luck, you guys. And I'll see you tomorrow for the exam.